Hey, what's up brothers? Mr. Halter here coming to you from the Post Commons coffee roasting room, as you'll see behind me. Beautiful roaster. Building the table today with this little bad boy. So anyway, I thought I'd take a moment and uh, give a few thoughts on an unbelievable passage of scripture. Second Timothy chapter two, verses three and four. I'm just gonna read the whole thing. I can see it. We got the glasses today. Actually, I'm going to go all the way back to two. Uh, Ryan started. You then, my son, be strong in the graces in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Now, this is our passage for this week. Join me in suffering like a good, like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. Rather, they try to please their commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. And then he goes to a third one. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive the share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. So let me try to give you a little insight into all this. And uh, obviously he's given us three images of um, an officer, um, essentially a soldier. A, uh, an athlete and a farmer. So I don't know which one of those three you may identify with, but um, all of them uh, are essentially Paul trying to help Timothy understand how you begin to position yourself in kingdom life. And so um, obviously the military, um, you know, they were under occupation. It looks like Russia is about to occupy Ukraine and if that happens and if there's no nobody stepping in, if we just watch them do what they're going to do, um, Russia will take over and there will be a completely new, like in a 24 hour period, people who lived under a certain reign or way of life will actually um, have to live under a completely different reign. It's, it's actually a wild thought. Um, I don't know how we would do if all of a sudden we actually believed that Russia was on our borders, all of our uh, bombs, the buttons to our bombs were not working and we were just literally going to get taken over how we would respond uh, to them wiping out our entire form of government. All of our customs, all of our cultures, no more Super Bowl Sundays, anything that's representative of American culture and all of a sudden they put in or they, they try to get us to live or they force us to live under uh, the way of the Soviets, if you will. Um, it would be a mind blower. So this is the context. Uh, those that are being written to right here are under occupation of the Romans. They don't like it. Uh, Romans do not give them any credibility. They belittle them, they dishonor them. Uh, they let them do their religion a little bit, but they control it and tax it and all sorts of stuff. And so he's saying here, suffer with Christ. That, uh, that that's the form of if you're part of a militia and you're and Jesus is the head of your militia, you have to understand that when you're not the dominant force, uh, your way of life is suffering. Um, it's, it's actually interesting. I know I've brought this up to you guys before, but when Jesus begins to teach in the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount was Jesus trying to help us understand that life under his reign would be different than life under the reign of the Romans or under the reign of their own Jewish faith, if you will. Um, that the kingdom of God is completely different than all these. And so if you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, if uh, one of these Roman guys walks by you and you're out on the streets with your family and he backhands you uh, and he, you know, hits you on the left side of your face, it says, go ahead and turn to him the right side of your face. And if somebody asks you for your uh, your shirt, give them your coat as well. It's, uh, you know, almost looks like Paul is saying, uh, or Jesus was saying, just be a complete wuss. Like let, let, let whatever dominant cultural power, uh, let them force their way upon you and make them make you like them. And that's not what Jesus was teaching. He was actually teaching a way that would subvert Rome eventually. Eventually the, the Christians subverted the dominant empire and it wasn't through any coercive uh, sense of power or political power it wasn't through nukes or social media it wasn't anything like that it was just that 
uh, when they got slapped on the right side, they did not cower and turn away from eye contact. They stood straight up and they looked the Roman centurion in the face and they went, hey, you want to take the other side as well? And everybody that would watch that happen would go, did you hear what Halter did in front of his kids? Like he didn't take it from the Roman centurion. The word would spread. And then other people, as they were being slapped, they would also stay on the ground. They wouldn't fight the Roman, uh, they, but they also wouldn't cower or kowtow to him. And slowly over time, it built a courage of a new people that eventually took out Rome. And so if a guy said, hey, give me your shirt, and you went, hey, and you're, you're now standing there without any clothes on, again, in front of people, and you go, hey, you, you might as well take my, my coat too. Like here, it probably meant Jesus would go like, just give me your pants. Uh, so imagine you do that and you're out there, all these people are watching. Do you hear what Halter did? Halter like stripped down buck naked, gave even his socks to the, Ro the Roman centurion was trying to get away from Halter, was getting embarrassing for him. And Halter was throwing his socks at the guy going, hey, you want that too? But this is what Jesus was talking about. So suffer with Christ. Um, don't take it from the dominant culture. Don't let them force you into their uh, pressure system. Don't let the world dictate how fast you have to run or how hard you have to work um, or how many years it has to be before you take a little time for yourself or your family. Uh, don't let them take up your Sabbath day. Don't let them uh, tell you what to do with your money. Uh, the way of Jesus is, is a completely counterculture way of life. And so uh, realize you're part of a new militia. And so act like it. Secondly, he says in an athletic sense, um, let me read this passage here. I want to make sure I get it right to you. Um, by the way, the, the military call is just don't be civilized. So don't be, you know, he actually says, um, don't act like you're involved in civilian affairs. That means don't be civilized. Revolt, fight back. Okay. Secondly, um, similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Uh, back in high school, here's my claim to fame in high school, guys. I played football and tennis, got scholarships in both, not to any big schools. I was too slow, but NAI level. And uh, I would play uh, football to get sort of uh, in shape for tennis. Tennis was my main thing. And uh, I played first man all four years of high school. And uh, this one, and I, you know, I never actually ever took a lesson. I was just kind of a self-taught. I'd go down to the middle school and I would hit balls against the wall under this covered thing for years. <laughs> That's all I did. And then I found some guys that could play decently. So I started playing tournaments around Oregon and uh, ended up by the time I tried out in high school, I was actually the best guy uh, by a long shot. And I, I don't know, I didn't expect that, but I just ended up being the first guy. So I'm playing against all these cats that have had lots of lessons. They have their, I don't know if you remember back in the eighties, they had those really tight Fila shorts, very uh, beautiful white. And then they would wear their collar shirts. I was in uh, those corduroy OP shorts, if you remember those. And uh, like a wife beater t-shirt or whatever it was. I just, I had no class. I looked like a complete thug, but I could play with these guys. And I was playing the third ranked guy in state uh, one time and I was beating the guy. I remember my dad just said, hey, just try to get in his head. Just hit everything straight down the middle. Don't even go for a line. Sit every ball back. Be like a wall. So I did. I was just boink, boink, everything right back down the middle. And uh, the guy started hitting him into the net, hitting him long. And, you know, I just right down the middle. Boop. Nothing special. And he started to get super frustrated. And I won the first set. 6-2. This kid is losing his mind. He's, he's F-bombing everything. And uh, people are starting to come around and watch this. And all of a sudden, on the second set, it continues. I just stick to the game plan. And he starts calling balls out that are literally in the middle of the court, like six feet on each side. Uh, he's going out. And he did that a few times. And I called him to the net and I said, hey, knock it off. And he didn't say anything. We go back, we keep playing. Uh, I had a serve three feet inside the line and he kind of uh, cracks it on, this, on the frame and he goes ah, out. And so I called him back to the net and I, and I knocked him out. It was my only fight in high school. 
Uh, I think I'm the only one in Oregon State tennis history to get uh, kicked out of a tennis match, actually out of the entire league for brawling. It wasn't really a brawl, but you know what I'm saying? Like this guy was trying to, to win the match without playing by the rules. I, of course, was trying to teach him a little kingdom. No, that's not the point, but you get the point. Like guys, if, if we're gonna uh, follow Jesus, we gotta play by his rules. We don't try to take shortcuts. So we're the first one in the military sense is don't be civilized. The second one is, is don't cheat. And cheating for a man is where you act like uh, you're winning on the outside and you're not paying attention to the inner life. Like almost everything related to winning in Jesus' sense, receiving the, the true crown that he offers to men is because of the transformation that goes on the inside of our life. That's, that's the real us. And so that's playing by the rules. Uh, when, when we're just kind of going through the motions and we're going to, or we're part of the church because we get good real estate clients out of it, or, um, you know, we keep our wives happy or whatever it is, whatever our purpose for trying to be spiritual, religious, but deep down we've got, you know, this interior life that just looks like a trash heap, then we're cheating and we're not going to receive the crown of life. It's not necessarily an eternal, it's not saying you're going to, you know, you're not going to make it if you do it. Um, most of uh, the stuff of judgment in the scriptures is really that we judge ourselves. We'll be judged by our, our activity in our life. Uh, when we see Jesus, he won't actually point out 462,000 oopsies. He'll just go, hey, tell me how it went. And then we'll, because we won't be able to lie, then we'll just have to, sort of deal with all the stuff that we sort of acted like wasn't there. And so he's just saying, when you're on this life, if you follow him, just come clean now. Like, just try to work on the inner life. Be be honest with other men. Uh, be honest with him. And uh, so play by his rules. Third one, you know, says a hard work working farmer. I don't know if any of you would say, yep, yeah, I'm a farmer now. I actually am now. Uh, as you know, we acquired the 40 acre farm. I'm learning how to plant things. Uh, my wife and daughter are starting a flower uh, grow operation. Um, we have this really beautiful bathroom. Now literally looks like a marijuana grow operation. There's lights hanging from chains and there's little starter plants all over the place. It's really annoying. But uh, the, the sort of the metaphor here um, is that there's a hardworking farmer. Okay, you, know, you might have just went right over that, but a um, somebody that's a landowner in this day and age is not working. He has hired tenant farmers. He has maybe slave farmers. The owner would never work his own land. And so Jesus is actually teaching Paul to teach Timothy. Um, look, the, the deal with the kingdom is that you don't sort of rest on your laurels. Um, you're not civilized, you don't cheat, and you work at it, okay? And many of you know that the work that we're doing here in Alton, it literally is a work. Um, when we recruit people, we now have about 15 businesses, um, several kind of justice works, uh, a couple nonprofits. But, you know, everything literally is a work. And so when, when we onboard people, we say, look, we want you to have your idea, but we don't just want you to kind of you know, kind of half-hearted, if you will. We use other words, but we say, you're gonna have to work. And sometimes I tell them that, look, I still haven't taken a paycheck from this. We're in year number six, but I'm still the one down here building a table uh, for the coffee roaster guy. And I'm, I'm putting in 30 hours a week um, because that's what the call requires. Um, and so you just gotta do the work. Um, don't act like an owner in anything of your life, always act like a worker. Uh, we're about to do a GoFundMe campaign because we need to raise a, a ton of money for this equine therapy. Let's just say that that works and we get a lot of money uh, in, or when we got the free building or somebody gave us a free house around the corner in a rougher part of town because they knew what we were doing. Whatever we get or whatever money comes free or assets come free, um, I believe that they come because we work it. Um, Cheryl has told other people that kind of always joke, well, how does Halter get all the free stuff? And she goes, well, 
uh, I think he gets it because God knows as soon as he gets it, he's going to work it harder than anybody. And I think that's there's there's some points in there. Is that when we like are not trying to get four golf rounds in a week, but we actually go, look, um, I'm going to actually labor for Christ. I'm going to do the hard things. I'm going to lift the heavy lifting. I'm not going to uh, keep sort of uh, shrugging it all off to the next guy. I'm not going to just let Tyler preach on the weekends and, and, and spiritually lead my family. It's when you say, I'm going to help lead my family. When you don't just let the youth pastor disciple your kids, but you go, no, I'm going to do the work. I'm going to actually be the most influential person in the spiritual life of my kids and so on and so forth. Then we're getting on about it. And so don't be civilized, don't cheat, don't act like an owner. Uh, these are the keys to the kingdom for men, I believe. So blessings to you guys. Um, men's retreat right around the corner. I am flying out to see you. I'm not speaking. I'm just hanging. I just want to um, get as much time with as many of you as I can. And uh, so I am going to be there. I can't wait. Um, I need the break. I need some time with Jesus and some men. Uh, you guys have become so important to me. So I hope that you will take the time for yourself and uh, and come, come for yourself. Like you actually need it, you deserve it. So uh, try to clear your schedule, try to make sure that you're not stressed out when you're there. Um, see if you can even clear all the emails so that when you're there for that two days, you can just really um, just ask the Lord to speak to you. So uh, hope to see you there and uh, we'll see you soon.